Mr. Wolf. Always fun being uh, last. I'm sure you're all looking at your watches. Yeah, I know. There we go. So, um, yeah, I get to be the closer, and again, appreciate the invitation to come here. And so, the request for me to talk about today was effective communicating, effectively communicating medication instructions, and this kind of ties in with a lot of things that have been discussed today. In fact, I think uh, the gentleman from the National Center for Health Statistics wondered why we were just so focused on medications, because this comes up so often. It's a very common and easily, uh, easy example to gravitate to when you start thinking about what's frustrating in healthcare. And, and I think there's a lot of reasons. So I'm going to be a little bit myopic here and then take a dive into, into specifically the task of medication use and thinking about the numeracy elements as well as some of the other uh, I would say problem-solving aspects that you know really make medication use incredibly difficult and challenging and the reason why we see so many problems just with this task alone with what may be viewed as one of the most common tools used in medicine to, to kind of uh, uh, promote health and, and keep people uh, in, in control for chronic disease and other things. So I'm going to start off with a brief overview. I really just had three tasks that I wanted to really kind of accomplish with this particular topic. And so following Rima Rudd's, you know, earlier in what she has, uh, I have learned from her over many, many years, it's about deconstructing the task. So I want to first just kind of do that with medication use and, and not just prescription medication use, but also over the counter, just how people kind of use medicine. And then review some of the pertinent epidemiology, which I think just kind of underscores why this is such a problem, what is the nature of the problem. And this has been something I think that's been talked about a couple times already in the, in the meeting about why do we spend a lot of time focused on an individual's ability and what they are struggling with and, and the issue that makes it look like it's very uh, much a patient problem. And I completely agree that uh, what has been echoed in, in uh, part of the report for many years, that this is a reflection of the complex complexity of the healthcare system. However, a lot of the looking at this epidemiology and the problems that we see, I think, is a reflection of uh, it's our outcomes assessment of how we're doing. Uh, and so I think looking at how people are understanding and acting and using medications and what problems, I think, is, is kind of our window into the root causes of what solutions are needed. And that's what I'll kind of end with uh, today in talking about some of the promising solutions that fit into the, the health literacy rubric and beyond, because it's such an eclectic field now. It's patient education and health communication and cognitive psychology and education uh, research as well as human factors and engineering. It just continues to expound and become very multidisciplinary. So why is taking medicine so hard? And this is not exhaustive, but this is what I just, in you know, having opportunity to work on many different aspects throughout the healthcare system in the continuum of medicine prescribing and dispensing, this is what I could come up with very quickly and you can probably add to it. It's very dynamic. You've got medicines that are being added and taken away from your regimen and being tweaked, you know, increased dosages and dosages that are dropped. In fact, uh, for kidney transplant at our transplant center, uh, post-transplant, we take your blood levels 42 times. And in each of these times, we assess your proper immune suppression and you get a phone call from a nurse saying, you know what, drop down from 10 to 5 milligrams. I mean, it's that intense where you could have medication changes occurring by phone uh, and everything and in, that you've received paper, any tangible material that tells you your pill bottle labels all of a sudden become defunct. You have multi-drug regimens with variable doses. You have multiple devices at times where you have not just pills, which we oftentimes think about, but other devices, and inhalers and asthma. Um, uh, you know, you've got, within the inhaler, you've got many multiple uh, devices as well, eye drops, lotions, et cetera. Tapered and escalating doses. Doses dependent on measurement, like, you know, what is your weight at this given moment, which is an example of some of the work that uh, has been done at UNC, um, I'll talk about later, that has been kind of uh, really promising in regards to explaining some of these things. Daily versus non-daily medicines. Limited duration versus chronic or extended duration medicines. PRN, pro renata, which means in the circumstance or as needed in seasonal medications that you throw in um, 
during the course of your regimen that might make things a little bit different that you don't want to organize in the same way. Multiple prescribers, multiple pharmacies, variable instructions you see, receive from both brand versus generic drugs that change over time and have what we call variable trade dress. That there, at one moment your generic medication for a particular chronic condition could be a small white pill and if your insurance changes and you get a new generic version of it, it could change its shape altogether. And then how do you deal with that, especially with Terry talking earlier about how much reliance many patients may have on just the look of their medications given the difficulty in pronouncing different drug names and whatnot. And unsynchronized fill dates from pharmacy, fills from pharmacy, where you may have to go back to the pharmacy multiple times because your medicines have been prescribed to you at different times and you just aren't synchronized. You're not just bundling everything together. So we found a few slides just again hit home the point even further of what we see patients getting uh, and, and the mess that this really is and why it isn't a surprise that people are being confused. Because what we're doing to them with the way we deliver a lot of these resources are exactly crazy. And this is not even so bad. Uh, you know, but tapered doses, if anybody's seen a tapered dose on a pill label, it's absolutely a mess. You know, and this then, of course, you've got the ones that this is really hard to take. So you know, but it's not the w drugs one at a time that you're trying to deal with. A lot of the, the focus and complexity that we spend time thinking about, it's on the multiple drug regimens, which is, you know, again, what we hear oftentimes with the baby boomer generation, chronic conditions are on the rise. You've got a lot of patients taking more and more medications. So it's how you not organize one medicine at a time, but not thinking about medication adherence and proper medication use. You're thinking about regimen use, regimen safety, regimen adherence. And the skill set that you think that you need to apply in, in managing this task is numeracy, but it's a lot of other things as well. So, you know, you, you, know, you can't parse out any particular health task necessarily as being solely uh, reliant on a numeracy skill set, but it's also reading and attention and memory, you know, and perspective memory, because you've got to go forwards and backwards. Uh, you know, did I take that medicine this morning? I can't really remember. It's become part of my routine, and God, I don't want to double up on it. But do I have to, do I, will I remember to take my medicine tonight before I go to bed? Uh, it's speed, because it's a seemingly simple and often unclear task. Whether or not you want it to be done quickly or not, you oftentimes do not apply a lot of time thinking about it, because it doesn't seem hard. Problem solving. That's an incredible aspect about medications. When you miss a dose of medication, what happens on the weekends? Fitting this into your lifestyle becomes incredibly challenging at times, as well as communication skills and many others. Again, not to focus on one's particular skill set, but it's a diverse range. I threw this in here, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but this is from a, a junior faculty that uh, worked with our LitCog data set from the National Institute of Aging, which is a cohort study funded um, through the Health Literacy Study Section panel, uh, and now in its sixth year. Uh, you know, all of this stuff is related. You know, the, this cognitive skill set that we put into it, you see correlations between reading and numeracy are quite high at 0.68. But what we found really interesting was when you think about how people perform everyday health tasks, we just showed, and or she showed, Elizabeth Wilson showed that, you know, that reading is strongly associated with, with being able to perform health tasks. And that's what many, many of our studies, no surprise, numeracy is associated with performance and health tasks, uh, specifically around medication use. But the combination of reading and numeracy skill sets, as you would imagine, is the variance explained by including both in the models is far, significantly far greater than either of those alone. And that's because, again, it's a diverse skill set that you have to tackle when you engage in all these different attributes of, of managing medicines. And again, moving through, you know, breaking down uh, all the skills and, and tasks that have to be performed while managing prescription drugs. Uh, Stacy Bailey at, at UNC in the School of Pharmacy uh, and I basically proposed just some, some kind of model here to at least for us to think about is also a way to understand targets for intervention. So we, you know, thinking about on the point of deciding how to take your medication, you know, what are my treatment options? Is one more effective than another? What are the risks associated with each? You know, understanding how many pills per dose, how long built between doses, how many pills per day, how many, what's a mil, how many milliliters in a teaspoon? And again, that, that goes a lot to uh, the work that's being done at NYU that I'll talk about a little bit with uh, Dr. Dreyer and Dr. Yin. 
When do I take medicine? Is twice daily the same as every 12 hours? Because I've got two medicines and they have instructions on the both that, that say these things. Can I combine them? Can I take these at the same time? What if I miss a dose? When can I take another dose of my pain medicine? Did I take my medicine? How much can I take today? Again, thinking about maximum daily dose for some prescriptions. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but that's just a sample of starting to think about the questions that people are having when trying to understand medicines. And the reason they're having these questions is because we're not adequately communicating this information to them. We have not decided, we have not done much to help people organize and use their daily regimens. So some important numbers on adult medication use. I just wanted, again, on the pertinent epidemiology side. So we know that from prior studies uh, uh, led by Terry Davis in Annals of Internal Medicine, we found that half of patients adult misunderstand common dosing instructions. And this is from our slide again. This is basically showing that about as much as, you know, as, much as people could um, teach back to us how they would take a medicine for taking two pills by mouth twice daily, when we ask people a simple question of how many pills would you take today then of that medicine, you know, for adequate literate patients, that was about four out of five could say I'd take four. That came to two out of three with marginal, and then about one in three out of adequate. You know, is it that they just couldn't do that basic math? Probably not. But look at the instruction. Take two pills by mouth twice daily. Could we have said it more clearly? Um, again, if you don't put a lot of time to the task and you read it quickly, it looks like take two pills twice a day or take two pills a day. So the most common wrong answer was two. Again, not the patient's fault. It's bad instruction. 60% struggle with auxiliary instructions when dosing medicine, and that's from many, many sources. But one example you can pull from NAL, you know, 60% of, 40% of patients got this one wrong. You know, again, and this was shown earlier, again, in, in one of the earlier slides. One in four make large dosing errors with pediatric liquid medication, and this was a study done by uh, Dr. Dreyer and Dr. Yin out of NYU, uh, that, and it depends on cup or dose or, you know, what is the most accurate instrument that you're working on? And there's a large scale uh, project funded by NICHD that's answering a lot of these questions about what is the best way to present information, milliliter, teaspoon, cup, or syringe, or, I mean, there's different ways to really think about what's going to help people best understand how to accurately measure out and give their child medicine. 85% may unnecessarily overcomplicate drug regimens. This comes from our study in Archives of Internal Medicine where we don't focus on the task of not just looking at when you take each medicine, but when do you take your regimen? When do you take all of your medicine? How many times a day are you stopping what you're doing to figure out, uh, I've got to take medication again, when you probably could be much more efficient? And we know that along with cost, regimen complexity is one of the most common reasons why people don't stay to stick to their medication. Don't, they don't adhere over time. And then one in four may exceed maximum daily dose on over-the-counter pain medications because, you know, they, and that's another study that we just came out with um, in, uh, in Journal of General Medicine this past, uh, in 2012 in December. We found, like, if you look around it, can you combine products? Can you add up the active ingredient in knowing how much money, that, how much, how many milligrams of acetaminophen are you supposed to, can you take safely in a day and knowing not to exceed that amount? Uh, we find people not only just having concomitant use, at high rates, but also uh, commonly exceeding uh, the maximum daily dose limit, which has become actually a subject of the FDA in which they made a voluntary reduction in the total grams per day, even though it's very far from the, the danger limit, as to Dr. Zygmunt Fisher's comment. And of course, I had to throw in this picture of uh, your own IOM member being surprised by 15 feet of pain, 80 square feet of pain. It is just amazing how many selections you have to get at. And, one of the things that I think is very interesting is do you pay attention to things like maximum, maximum strength, extra strength, uh, rapid release, extended release? Because uh, what we find a lot of times is that these products, you know, that uh, have become familiar with us for as many of us have spent decades taking these medicines, you don't even read the bottle. How many people read the bottle anymore? If there's a new warning, there's new information, will you read it? Or do you just naturally know, I can take eight of these, I think. Well, that might not be the case if I'm taking a dose that is, is an excessive dose. Uh, because they, again, industry offers lots and lots of options. And we may not pay attention to what the, the difference is between one version versus the, the next. So now some important numbers on the consequences. And then I'll move into and wrap up uh, the, the talk on some of the solutions we've been working with. So half of adults demonstrate inadequate adherence to Rx regimens. And that's pretty common and in in consistent in the cardiovascular and diabetes 
literature, and the only time I've ever seen it uh, show respectable numbers in the 70 to 80 percent range is in the context of HIV, where uh, adherence research has been basically was uh, has been such the main, the fo main focus for the past uh, two decades or three decades now. Uh, Twenty percent of new prescriptions go abandoned, and never filled at the pharmacy. One and a half million adverse drug reactions annually, with a quarter of a million of those in children. And from a recent study from a hepatology fellow working with us, uh, we have half of patients, uh, half of acute liver failure cases in the United States are caused by a acetaminophen, acetaminophen overdose, uh, compared to only about a third, which are viewed as intentional. And 61% of these cases are unintentional and exceeding the maximum dose is, was identified as the, as the root cause. So potential solutions for these issues, it, it matters. Uh, in a lot of this task, so the task is complicated and uh, the consequences are significant. So it's a health system versus a patient problem, and that's the approach that we've been working through. And, and to our dear colleague, Alistair Wood, uh, his comment that was also became the, uh, the title of uh, the IOM workshop, uh, standardized medication labels, uh, kind of catchphrase, confused, can we confuse people less? Uh, and so we view this as a multifaceted problem, and it requires a multifaceted solution. So three of the suggestions that you know, we've been trying to contend with, and, and I've been uh, trying to summarize here as some of the greatest hits that I've been uh, seeing from the work that we've been trying to go through and also many others, is that how do you improve standardized, tangible patient information like drug labeling? And there's been some great success with what's been passed in the state of California, uh, the U.S. Pharmacopeia, with many of the people in the room being part of, uh, you know, setting new standards and recommendations for better drug labeling. How to increase prevalence and quality of patient counseling, because what we've learned from a, a few studies now is that the above, uh, improving drug labeling, cannot uh, be, is a, an important part of a nutritious breakfast, per se. It's important to do, but it's not the only thing that you can do to expect uh, improvement. There needs to be more provider-patient communication. And so what can we be doing on that to help people really understand some of these complex things and to also continually stay connected with them? Because again, it's a dynamic behavior. It constantly changes. And you need to make sure that when changes occur, that they don't uh, continue to misunderstand or misuse the medicine. Imagine waiting three months uh, to see your, di your diabetic patient again to find out that they've been misusing their regimen. Uh, and then we need to engineer new and old, lower and high tech support tools. And there's a lot of that. And it's becoming an incredibly overpopulated market and with very, very little evidence. So a lot of what we're looking for in these interventions might be how can we help do the math and constantly check the work of these uh, of people taking a lot of complex drug regimens to make sure that our message is getting through, that we're doing as much as we can to help simplify the behavior that they have to perform on a daily basis so it doesn't become something that's really obtrusive. Uh, this is the uh, what was shown to you earlier uh, by uh, Terry Davis, our universal medication schedule. And I think um, uh, I'm feeling a little bit uh, like maybe I have to retire this slide after a while because it's been we've been showing it quite a bit, but it ha we're not there yet, so that's why it's important. We're very close to making this part of a standard, and we're incorporating it in electronic health records, working with pharmacies and so forth to make this become something that's a best practice. And there's a lot of evidence to support it in building. Um, basically, the idea is rather than saying variably, take two tablets a day, but twice you know, to take two tablets twice daily, provide more explicit information about that. And that is an evidence base that we've shown both in our work and work dating back to 1995. Uh, in the corner, you can see a, what one of the labels actually look like being generated from a central field pharmacy through a clinic uh, clinical trial study. And I added this, this graphic. Um, uh, we have two uh, R01s that uh, have been funded uh, by ARC and have also by the Office of Behavioral and Sponsored, uh, Office of um, Behavioral and uh, Social Science Research, OBSSR at NIH. Uh, for the latter, and uh, the first findings that came out showed that just by making a change in a drug label, providing more explicit information on one's drug regimen, that we showed a pretty uh, impressive uh, improvement, um, short term in terms for adherence, but long term building, helping patients uh, over the course of a year as they increase their understanding of their drug regimens without doing anything besides changing the label. No orientation to the label, it just became a new practice that they started to see with a drug label. But can you imagine all of your labels saying morning, noon, 
evening or bedtime, rather than some of them saying every 12 hours, some saying twice daily, some saying 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., and then you having to figure out how to incorporate them. That was our goal, was to find it, to bring it together. Um, it, so it's, it's, this is part of the solution, and it's promising, and we're still, still learning more. And for time's sake, I won't spend too much time on that. But what we're trying to also offer is tools that can be done at the point of prescribing, not just at the pharmacy, and not just for one medicine at a time, but for an entire regimen. So working with our transplant center, we started to think through, and we've already tried to mock these up, uh, and we have kind of the, the, the know-how to do this with an electronic health record, how we can take an entire regimen, and this is what they currently do, the usual care, and this was a strategy that we're planning out for, uh, for our transplant group, where you can take that regimen and see how we could possibly impart the UMS to everything, and they could see, they could actually imagine this is something that you could generate and give to them, and then you could imagine pushing it to a patient portal. So if they do get a telephone call, that it could be immediately updated, um, rather than um, them having to throw out the paper and wait for something to be mailed or wait till they go to the clinic again to get some information. So that's why we're trying to work again with uh, a new medium, that being kind of a, an electronic one, the EHR, to be able to recognize that in real time we could make changes and there's new opportunities for, for that to be um, updated and, and meet patients' needs. I also want another, on the drug information, some other great work that's been going on right now and again at NYU and we have one of the members, the senior member of the study, uh, the senior author of the study here uh, in front with, that's now JAMA Pediatrics, I realize it switched. So, um, you know, using icons, uh, especially in the case of using a device like, uh, like uh, syringes and, um, and cups and so forth, can be incredibly powerful and have a, a wonderful effect. So I thought that was a, a great hit to kind of make a mention. Uh, one thing that also is in the drug space is people are trying to consider, and this is something that um, I was part of the FDA Risk Communication Committee, is use of a standard uh, medication uh, prescription drug fax box. And uh, this is a little bit controversial and it was not passed through, but it was something that uh, to be able to, and I, you, if anybody has seen this, it's in the Annals of Internal Medicine, but it tries to both quantify and qualify risk simultaneously. Um, and I think people still found it a little bit confusing, but it is something that is out there and is still kind of being vetted. I'm not going to spend much more time. Uh, we've also been doing work on trying to improve medication guides and risk communication that impart safe use, trying to figure out how to build the bridges to, uh, between pharmacy and physician so they can be coordinated and communicating with patients in both at least increasing the prevalence of counseling. I did want to make a quick mention. I know I'm out of time. Uh, but the re I wanted to make a, a mention to another member of the, the IOM Roundtable, uh, Dr. DeWalt's work uh, with uh, Michael Pignoni and others, Dean Schillinger and Dave, David Baker, uh, who's with us at Northwestern. There's a large collection of research on what I think is one of the most complicated contexts for medication use, which is uh, congestive heart failure. And I think from, and maybe Darren can speak more, uh, you can all catch him before he runs off, but uh, to actually talk a little bit about how you explain issues when you have to kind of uh, your medication use is dependent on uh, um, another measure that you have to wake up in the morning, weigh yourself, determine what you have to, based on your weight, what your medication is. And they've shown some success with a teach to goal strategy. So there is information out there that we've talked about earlier in the, in the, in the day today about how do you help providers better communicate information around medication use. And I think that's really, really important and, and still uh, needs more exposure. So I'll probably stop here outside of just saying that here are areas of research that we have not really covered. External aids, um, very much uh, less tested. Blister packing is another issue to get rid of the math completely, but also has lots of problems. Uh, bundling medications is something that lots of pharmacies are now trying to consider, that you can synchronize all the medications so people don't have to go back and forth and have all of this kind of, again, uh, this, uh, this disruption in their drug regimen. Mobile apps. We just did an external scan of 14,000 apps on the iTunes and Google Plus uh, platforms and found 440 mobile apps that are currently available to help manage medications and looking at user reviews for that. Um, again, it's, we, are, we are inundated with this type of work. Uh, and so uh, I'll leave it at that, saying that there's a, the story is to be continued as far as what's the best practice, but we have a lot of near successes uh, in this space. So thank you.
Thank you for those great presentations. We now have uh, 